Okay, um, picking up uh, where we left off, we left off having understood what res judicata is about, and the place we have to go now is to collateral estoppel, the other important issue in this area. to deal with the following situation. This is a case where two people have an accident at the, uh, at the corner and uh, A and plaintiff and defendant uh, have an accident uh, and plaintiff, uh, and it's the accident, uh, plaintiff uh, and the two cars collide and the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the one of the cars bounces off the collision car and hits a parked car. So there really are three cars involved. Two cars that were in motion and then one of them bounced and hit a parked car. So the two cars that were in motion, plaintiff sues defendant and the uh, plaintiff says to defendant, you ran the light. And the defendant says, no, I did not run the light. Uh, they go to trial, okay, and there's a ton of witnesses showing that the defendant, in fact, ran the light. And so the defendant loses, and plaintiff collects and gets his car repaired. Now, the person whose car was parked says, well, my car was damaged also. And the person whose car was parked sues the same defendant who said, I did not run the light, but the witnesses say he did. Uh, and this person sues that defendant, and now the defendant comes to court again and says, I didn't run the light. Well, we just had five witnesses who testified that the defendant did run the light. And so, uh, when the, and in the previous trial, are we going to go through all that again? Or should this defendant be bound by the decision from the last court that the court has already concluded that he did run the light? That issue has been litigated and it is, in fact, uh, been decided by the court and you don't get to litigate who ran the light again. And that's what collateral estoppel is about, that to prevent this same defendant from defending on what amounts to the same issue again when they've already lost it. And so if that's what you're trying to do with uh, the doctrine of collateral estoppel, then what rules should you apply? What rules should you have that will be used to decide when the defendant can no longer deny that he ran the light? when the defendant is collaterally stopped to deny that he ran the light. Well, here are the rules that you would come, come up with. Now remember now, the basic question is, what are the rules we're going to apply to decide when the defendant can no longer claim that he did not run the light? And so, one is identity of issues. That's large enough. That's large enough. So you agree, in our case, is who ran the red light. And so we have identity of issues. That's one requirement that you will have. Secondly, second requirement is that the, um, uh, the, um, is that the party against whom the doctrine is applied was a party to the lot prior suit. Let me put this on the board so we can talk about it. The party against whom the doctrine is applied 
was a party to the prior suit. Well, in our case, that worked because we we're applying the doctrine against the defendant who said, I did not run the light, and that person was a party to the prior suit. And so, and we're applying the doctrine against that person. So that's the second requirement. Third requirement is that the uh, suit has been, the, the matter was litigated on the merits. Now, the matter was litigated on the merits uh, means uh, that what we're trying to do here is to avoid those cases where someone got a judgment against them, not because the court decided you ran the light, but because the person didn't show up in court, uh, or because of some technical reason such as that. They, uh, they, uh, the court didn't really make a decision that they could, the person got a default judgment against them, for example. So in the case of a default judgment, the, uh, our defendant in this, in this car accident case, the defendant hasn't really litigated anything. They just decided it wasn't worth the trouble to show up in court because there wasn't that much money involved. So they just didn't show at all. And then they got a default, the plaintiff got a default judgment against them. Well, are you still going to claim that they uh, 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 you still going to claim that they didn't that they uh, 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 you still going to hold it against them that they ran the light? Okay. In other words, when the uh, there was no there was no litigation at all, and still that you you now saying a default judgment, and you going to hold it against them that they ran the light anyway? When they didn't even show up in court, there was no litigation at all. And they got a default judgment because of some technical reason, something to do with discovery or something of that sort. And the general rule is no. The general rule is that if the person got a default judgment, that they will, uh, if they got a default judgment, then they, they will, um, this will be, will not be treated as a matter which was actually litigated. Okay, it was not actually litigated, and so uh, collateral estoppel should not apply against someone who just took a default judgment. Now, uh, there are a few states, and California happens to be one of them, that takes the position that if you uh, get a default judgment, uh, you get a default judgment, that all the issues which were needed to decide the default judgment they treat those as having been litigated. And so if the question, if it was necessary for the defendant to have run the light in order to, um, in order to get the default judgment, in other words, that's the claim. The plaintiff claimed the defendant ran the light, the defendant didn't show up in court, she got a default judgment. Then the courts say that that, that default judgment, that everything that was decided, everything that was needed, to be decided to get the default judgment, will be you'll be collaterally stopped to uh, deny that. And so California is one of those states where it said have it's one of the minority states where you treat default judgments as though they really have been litigated. Most jurisdictions do not treat default judgments as though they've been litigated. Litigated on the merits. The fourth requirement is that the decision is final. And then if the matter is on appeal, then you don't have a final judgment yet. And the fifth one is that the, the decision on the issue that you're now talking about was necessary to the outcome of the prior case. The decision was necessary to the outcome of the prior case. In other words, if uh, the court made a decision about something but, and they put it in the, in the opinion of the judge. Well, if it was something that you didn't really need to make a decision about, 
in order to resolve this lawsuit, then you don't give it any legal effect. I mean, suppose, the, uh, and so uh, that makes sense, I'm sure. So the, de the decision was essential. To the outcome of the prior suit. Now, this is going to be an issue. Uh, decision is necessary to the outcome of the prior suit uh, because if the judge makes decisions about things which are not necessary to the outcome of the prior suit, we call that victim. And the judges can write all the victim they want to in these decisions. They have no legal consequences. They weren't necessary to resolve that lawsuit. Now, we see an example of that over here in this problem of Danco and uh, these people. You see uh, that uh, what happened here, that the, uh, the court went, went on but here, the court decided that Paul was not the owner of Black Acre, and Black Acre wasn't damaged anyway. Well, you can see that if Paul is not the owner of Black Acre, then Paul isn't going to get anything from the lawsuit. And it doesn't matter whether the, whether the property was damaged or not. Paul is not going to get anything because he was, uh, not, he was uh, not the owner. So once the court has decided on the adverse possession claim that Paul is not the owner of Blackacre, then it was not essential for them to decide whether or not Blackacre was damaged. It wasn't necessary at all. This by itself determines that Paul is not going to get anything. And so the decision that Blackacre wasn't damaged was not necessary to the outcome of this first suit. And that's what's going to, one of the things that's going to stop uh, the Danco from saying the court has already decided that Blackacre wasn't damaged, and therefore you can't claim that Blackacre was damaged. There are a couple of uh, defenses here. When Owen sues Danco, Danco is going to say the court's already decided Blackacre wasn't damaged, well, that's not going to work for the reasons we just talked about. And secondly, Danco, the, the, secondly, Danco is trying to use collateral estoppel against Owen when Owen was not a party to the prior suit. So remember, if you're going to use collateral estoppel against somebody, they had to be a party to the prior suit. And Owen was not a party to the prior suit. And so uh, that's the second reason you couldn't use collateral estoppel. Continuing then, that's number five, and finally number six. Uh, number six, uh, we have to deal, I need a rule for dealing with the odd situation where, uh, let's go back to the car accident, where plaintiff sues defendant, and uh, the plaintiff sues defendant for $200 for hitting his, his 19, you know, 75 Volkswagen or something. And so the plaintiff sues defendant and uh, the plaintiff uh, recovers. Says, defendant, you ran the light. You got these five witnesses showing that the defendant ran the light. And the plaintiff gets $500 for the damage to his Volkswagen. Okay? Plaintiff wins, collects the $500. Make it $200 just to make the point. The plaintiff wins and collects $200 to replace the buffer on his Volkswagen. Now, turns out that the car that bounced off the, from the accident and hit the parked car, well, the parked car was a, uh, was a Rolls Royce. And uh, actually it was a, a, Maserati, was a, a Maserati. And uh, a $250,000 Maserati. And uh, one of a few of a kind, collector's items and so forth. Hit the car and did a hundred thousand dollars worth of damage to that car. And now the person who owns the Maserati 
sues the defendant, says, defendant, the court's already decided you ran the light. And in fact, in that $200 lawsuit that you lost, the court decided you ran the light. So now pay me 150000 for the damage to my Maserati. And you see the problem, that the person who was defending against the $200 suit, if they didn't know that this other suit was coming down, they would not have put up a very vigorous defense. I mean, how much vigor do you put in a defense for $200? The answer is not very much. And so the person wasn't really uh, uh, motivated to defend that much because all they had to pay was $200. And now if you take the results of that suit, who ran the light, and hold it against them in a $150,000, $100,000 lawsuit for the damage to the Maserati, you can see that really isn't fair, uh, especially if they didn't see it coming. And one of the ways you can not see that coming, for example, is a person has an accident with a $200 fender bender, and there was a person in one of the cars. And everybody gets out of the cars and says, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, and there's $200 worth of fender. And they litigate, pay the $200. Then after the suit's over, one of the people that's in the car now says, you know, I thought I was fine at the time, but it turns out that my back is injured and I'm uh, quadriplegic now from that accident from, you know, uh, and uh, I want recovery. Well, you didn't see that suit coming, but you can see that paying this person a million dollars or something for the injury that happened to them, holding the, when you litigate it for a $200 fender bender, and now you hold that judgment against you in a million dollar suit is just unfair. And so that's what this is all about. The sixth item is that the defendant had to be sufficiently motivated to, to be fair to hold this holder against them. Defendants sufficiently motivated and you see how the defendant can easily not be sufficiently motivated when they think it's a small lawsuit and unexpectedly the result is held against them in a big lawsuit. So these are the requirements for, you need all six of these, not one, but you need all six of these satisfied in order to uh, uh, apply the doctrine against somebody. So in our case, where uh, Danco is suing on, remember back over here in this problem? In this problem, you remember that uh, Danco here is suing on, pardon me, backwards. Owen is suing Danco. Owen is suing Danco, and Danco is going to say to Owen, you can't sue us because property wasn't damaged, and he's going to let Danco apply collateral estoppel against Owen. And the answer is no, but let's look at all the reasons, because you want them all included in your answer. The... Uh, looking at the reasons... When this is now uh, we're talking about the suit or on on versus Danko. Uh, identity of issues. Well, the question was, yes, was Black Acre damaged? Because Danco is saying Black Acre was not damaged, and Owen is saying Black Acre was damaged. So we have identity of issues. Number two, the party against whom the doctrine is applied was a party to the prior suit. Well, Danco is trying to apply collateral estoppel against Owen. Danko is trying to fight against Owen, and Owen was not a party to the prior suit. The prior suit was be between um, uh, was between uh, Paul and uh, Danko. So this is a no. So already we cannot apply the doctrine because we found one of them that wasn't satisfied. Second, litigated on the merits. 
Yes, they told us this was a full-blown trial, jury trial, in fact. Uh, well, full-blown trial. The decision was final. Uh, I presume it was, but we weren't told. But you can uh, make a comment on that. The decision was essential to the outcome of the prior suit. We got a no here. Because the decision that Black Acre was not damaged was not necessary to the out to the prior suit because once the court decided that Paul did not own Black Acre, then it wasn't necessary to decide whether or not it was damaged. We don't have any information on item six. So we have two reasons here as to why collateral estoppel would not apply. Now let's go through and finish the reading and complete the problem. Uh, the uh, continuing, we have uh, that we are at uh, line 10. Danco denied that Black Oak was damaged and claimed that Paul, who asserted ownership by Black adverse possession, was not the owner. The court, on uh, line 11, the court heard extensive evidence. Uh, so this is not a default matter, and concluded that because Paul had no interest in Black Acre, Paul had no interest, and because Black Acre was not damaged, then Paul could not recover. We've been through that. And judgment for Danco was entered. Line 15. Owen of Paul sued against Danco. Now you see the problem because you can see how when when uh, Paul sued Danco and Owen didn't even know about it, not only was he not a party, he didn't even know about it, you certainly should not hold that against Owen. Continuing, line 17. Two months after judgment was entered, so I guess this it was not appealed, I suppose. They gave you the two months because typically you have a short period to appeal, maybe 30 days or something like that. And so you point out that apparently this matter is final because uh, there's no appeal. Two months after judgment was entered, Owen, the true owner of Black Acre, filed a complaint in federal court against Danco, claiming damage to Black Acre from the same conduct involved in Paul's suit. This is the Owen versus Danco suit right here that we were talking about earlier. Uh, the uh, Danco moved for judgment against Owen, uh, asserting the defense of the res judicata and collateral estoppel. Well, neither one is going to work. Collateral estoppel will not work for the two reasons we talked about, and res judicata always has to be between the very same two parties. And this is not between the same parties. This last suit is Owen versus Danco, and the earlier suit was Paul versus Danco. And so uh, res judicata always requires that the litigation was between the same parties and also requires that it's about the same transaction or occurrence. And in a primary right state, it will also require that it's in the same primary right. Continuing uh, line, 20, line 20, the motion was denied on the grounds that there was no legal basis upon which Danco could use the doctrine of either collateral estoppel or res judicata. And we agree that Danco right here cannot use either doctrine against Owen. Cannot use res judicata because it's a different person. Cannot use collateral estoppel because two of the elements, uh, two required elements were missing. This brings us to line 24. Paul sought to intervene as a plaintiff in Owen's suit. Now, let's see here. Uh, on so our second suit here is that Owen has sued uh, Danco and Paul wants to intervene. Uh, Paul wants to intervene as he wants to add to this Paul versus Danco. So you don't let him intervene or not. Now be careful that you don't go off on a rap about intervention if they don't ask you about it. In fact, in none of the civil procedure questions in the past 
have the bar examiners ever ask about intervention. Although intervention is mentioned in the fact pattern from time to time for some reason, but you never ask, you've never been asked actually to lay out the rules of intervention. I'm not saying you never will. I'm just saying watch it because there you can be misled. Uh, line 24, Paul sought to intervene as a plaintiff in Owen's suit, alleging that Dan Phil's conduct damaged Whiteacre. So Paul wants to sue here, claiming that Whiteacre was damaged. And so uh, we have a uh, uh, coming white. Now where is Whiteacre? Well, I assume that Whiteacre is some man nearby here. Let's put it right here. So I think Whiteacre was damaged, and uh, Paul is suing for damage to Whiteacre. Uh, well, Paul has already sued for damage to Blackacre and lost. And the problem that you're faced with here is that when Paul sued for damage to Blackacre, shouldn't he have sued for uh, all of his damage in one lawsuit? And if you have two horses and they are both injured by the explosion, can you sue horse by horse? Or do you have to sue for all of the damages in one lawsuit? And the answer is you have to bring them all in one lawsuit. And particularly if they're in the same primary right in a primary right state. And so here, real property is in the same primary right in both cases. And Paul sued for damage to one piece of real property, and then brings another lawsuit for damage to another piece of real property. And it seems to me that he can't really do that. And he's got to bring all of his real property claims in that one lawsuit. And he's got to bring them uh, the entire transaction or occurrence. So Paul, when Paul now sues for damage to Blackacre, and now he's going back a second time trying to sue for damage to Whiteacre, I think that uh, res judicata might very well apply. That the transaction or occurrence harm caused by Danco's explosions, that the transaction or occurrence should include all the damages that Paul suffered, and res judicata ought to apply against Paul. The one argument that Paul had is that even though he, he mistakenly, incorrectly, and unwisely sued only for damage to Blackacre, that he was dismissed. He really was, uh, he lost this lawsuit for what amounts to lack of standing, because he didn't own Blackacre. And if he lost the lawsuit for lack of standing, Paul can argue that, in effect, he hasn't sued, uh, because he didn't have any standing for the last lawsuit. So in effect, Paul has not sued at all. In that case, Paul can now join in for damage to Whiteacre, only if he can win that argument that since he was dismissed in this Blackacre suit, in effect, for lack of standing, because he didn't own it, that in effect he hasn't sued for anything. And so then uh, the, uh, uh, that what he did really was to sue for adverse possession to get his title, and he lost that, and didn't really, the damage issue really wasn't litigated. So that's uh, the answer to these questions. And, um, that will bring us to our last question, which is uh, another question involving res judicata, collateral estoppel, and primary rights. I picked this primary rights question because California is a primary rights jurisdiction, and uh, we know that California civil procedure is being tested, and therefore we want to uh, include these issues. Uh, now, this, uh, this question was a question involving primary rights. They didn't ask you anything about California. It's an older question. But it does involve primary rights and is therefore very useful. The question is uh, Paul versus Dahl from the February 84 bar. And let's take a look at that. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to erase this side. five days on vacation in the East Coast State X. He was on his way home to West Coast State A when his car collided with a car driven by Paul. The collision occurred in State Y, 10 miles beyond the State X border. So let's see what we've got here. Uh, uh, Daw uh, was this Dahl lives on the west coast over here. Uh, the doll lives there. And uh, well, the, here is a lot of miles in between here. And here is state Y. Uh, this is state A, this is state Y, and uh, the accident happened here. The awful cars. This is where the accident happened. I guess I should put these wheels down below, huh? There you go. Uh, happened in state Y, and this is just 10 miles inside of state Y, and over here is state X. And state X is where Paul lives. The fact that here is just 10 miles in. Line 10. Paul, a citizen of State X, filed an action against the doll in State X court. So over here we have a suit. Paul versus doll in this court, in this uh, state. You can see the problem already because uh, Paul lives in state X and Dahl lives in state A. So you've got diversity, all right? You say, listen, and this was in the state court anyway, so we don't even need diversity. So Paul sues here in state court. And uh, Paul alleges $700 in property damage. So we have a lawsuit here. Our first lawsuit is Paul versus Dahl. And this is in state court. And the fact that it is in state X, in state X. And you already see the jurisdiction issue coming up because I'm not convinced that the court in State X can get personal jurisdiction over Dahl to make Dahl come back here. After all, that's going to be a serious problem because the accident did not happen here. Paul really just passed through this state and then was on his way home. And so I don't think you have an appropriate basis. We'll go through the details. Always go through the details. So state X, and then secondly, uh, he, he wants seven hundred dollars in uh, um, property damage. This is personal property. Now this could be important because if we are in a primary rights state, then it's important to notice that Paul sued Daw in this primary right only. If we had sued 
In this court, this is in state court. And in state court, uh, this state might very well be a primary right state. And if so, the Paul has only used one of his primary rights. And if Paul wants to sue later for other primary rights, he can even go to federal court, as long as he doesn't bring up this primary right again. But if he goes to federal court, all the rights that are left out of that transaction or occurrence will be litigated at that time, whether Paul brought only one of them or brought them all. So uh, this is where we stand right now, continuing. Uh, the uh, doll was served at his home state. Okay, the doll was served here. And uh, to move to quash service of process, again, quash service is the formal name, even though it sounds kind of colloquial. It is the formal name for the, uh, uh, denying the jurisdiction of the court, personal jurisdiction. Quash service of process on the ground that the court lacks personal jurisdiction over him. So, you know you're going to have to go through that. Let's look at it real quick. Personal jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction over Dahl. Personal jurisdiction over Dahl. And that's going to require a basis, a long-run statute, and notice. As to the basis, the basis can be the traditional basis, or it can be the modern basis. You know the traditional basis, and none of them are going to work here. Daw is not domiciled in state X. Daw did not consent. Daw was not present in state X when served. That's why they told you that Daw was served in his home state. So none of the traditional uh, methods are going to, want, going to work, traditional basis. And so we look to the modern basis, and the modern basis are systematic and continuous and uh, certainly they told you, so this is going to be a no, and this is a no because they told you that Daw went to State X for a vacation. It doesn't have systematic and continuous activities there. So the only possibility would be the Martin basis, and the Martin basis I mean, would be minimum contact. They would be purposeful availment, purposeful availment, nexus, foreseeability, and fear. Well, let's take a look at that. The uh, purposeful availment. Uh, did Paul purposely avail himself of the benefits of State X? Pardon me, did Dahl? Yes. Dahl went to State X and drove on the roads here, had a vacation, and left, and was on his way home. He was on his way home when this accident happened. He was going this way. And so the question is, did Paul uh, purposely avail himself of the benefits of state X? Yes, he used their roads and stuff. Item two, number right here. Nexus, did the cause of action arise out of the purposeful availment? No. He used the roads in state X, but the cause of action in state Y would not be viewed as having arisen because he used the roads in State X. Now, I know that he happened to have gone through State X to get here, and he'd been in State X for a while, but you can't, if you do that, every place that you've ever been in your life could say, well, you were back here at one point, and you, you had an accident, you know, three months later in a different state, and you wouldn't have been in that state if you hadn't gone through the state X, of course that's not going to work. So the mere fact that he had at one time in the past been in state X uh, is not, does not mean the cause of action later on arose out of being in state X. No, it didn't arise because he was in state X. So we have a no to the nexus point. And that's going to defeat this cause of action. So this is going to be a no. 
foreseeability? Is it foreseeable that if you had one time in the past had spent some time in state X, that you may have to go back there and defend for a car accident just because one of the citizens called and you had an accident? In other words, if you were in Nebraska last month and now while you're traveling in Arizona, you have an accident with a Nebraska citizen, should you have to go to Nebraska and defend because you were in Nebraska last month? The answer is no way. It's not foreseeable and would not meet the fairness concept either. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, you don't even, you, well, you don't even get to this. Remember the rule about this fourth element here is that you don't get to the fourth element unless the first three have been satisfied. If the first three are satisfied, then and only then do you look to see if it's fair. Because the court uh, looks at the fairness after they figure out that, yeah, we could exercise jurisdiction. But if the court could not exercise jurisdiction because these, any one of these first three were not there, then you never get to this uh, second issue of fairness. So the answer is no to the personal jurisdiction. Uh, the uh, long-arm statute, they uh, don't uh, give us the long-arm statute, but you, uh, you, you make this claim here that all states have one. And the notice of the yes, because they told you that Dahl was served in state, they told you Dahl was served in state A. So that's what you would do about the personal jurisdiction. This brings us next uh, to uh, line 15. Line 15, Dahl then filed an answer that denied negligence on his part and alleged contributory negligence. So Dahl says, I wasn't negligent, and Paul, right here in this lawsuit, Dahl says, I wasn't negligent, and Paul, you were contributory negligent. So that's Paul's answer to the lawsuit. Line 18. Paul served interrogatories on Dahl, which requested the substance of a conversation that Dahl had with his wife and his attorney, investigator, soon after the accident. Well, that's not going to work, because the attorney's investigator apparently was at, let's say, the home of uh, Dahl and his wife. And uh, the... Dahl requested the substance of a conversation that Dahl had with his wife and his attorneys invest and his attorneys investigated. So Dahl's a defendant. Dahl's got a lawyer. Dahl's lawyer's got an investigator. The investigator goes out to the home over here, the home of Dahl and his wife. And while the three of them there are having a conversation, uh, things are said that are important. And now. Paul wants the contents of that conversation. And the main thing you have to point out is that the attorney-client privilege will apply to the, uh, to the investigator who is out acquiring information and what they say to the attorney, to the investigator. In private, the attorney-client privilege will attach. And uh, not only the attorney-client privilege, but also probably work product certainly the attorney-client privilege. Uh, continuing, and so in the interrogatory that Paul sent out to Dahl, he says, I want to know what you and your wife said to the investigator. Well, forget it. He's not going to get that. Continuing, says, when Dahl refused to answer these and those interrogatories, Paul moved to compel answers. Okay, well, that's what you do. And the court granted the motion. Well, the court shouldn't have granted that motion. That's privileged stuff. Uh, line 21. A $700 default judgment was entered against Dahl when he refused to comply with the discovery order. Well, uh, the, uh, you see that there was no real litigation in this case. Okay? No real litigation because he really didn't, uh, he got a default judgment and collateral estoppel are not going to apply. Res judicata applies because whether you get a default judgment or any other kind of judgment, 
the matter has in fact been litigated and you can't go back to court and do the same lawsuit all over again. So res judicata applies to default judgment. But in most jurisdictions, collateral estoppel does not. And uh, the, uh, in California, it does. So uh, he got a default judgment. And now we already know that in most states, collateral estoppel is not going to apply. And uh, to apply to what? Well, Paul sued, let's take a look here. This is a, a, we don't know whether this is a primary right state or not, but Paul sued for $700 personal property damage. When Paul sued for $700 personal property damage, in the federal courts, the entire transaction of occurrence is res judicata. In the California courts, Paul could come back and sue again for any of these, in the, under any of these other primary rights. But let's keep going. Uh, the, uh, the line 22, state X follows the federal rules of civil procedure with regard to discovery sanctions, and Dahl did not appeal the judgment which became final. Well, so we've got the final part over here. So the judgment had become final, and that takes care of this part. And they also point out that the state X follows the federal rules of civil procedure regarding sanctions, and what you needed to tell the bar examiners about these sanctions here is that uh, the uh, uh, is that the court, when people do not comply with discovery orders. Obviously, the court's got to have the power to do something about it, and what they can do about it, they can fine people, they can uh, they can uh, uh, make the the, uh, the the non-complying side pay for the cost of the other side coming to court to get this court order to comply. The court can also, if the person continues to refuse to comply. The court can say, okay, uh, whatever the other side is trying to prove with this piece of evidence that they're trying to get from you that you won't give them, we, the court, will simply just rule that that fact is determined in your favor. So that's another sanction that they can use. Uh, the court can give a default judgment as a sanction. But a default judgment really and truly is the ultimate sanction. It's the ultimate sanction because when you go to court, the only thing you're going to court for is to get a judgment against the other side. You're not going there for any other reason. And if the court just gives the other side the judgment, that's the most they can do to you. And so that is the ultimate judgment. And the courts do not give default judgments for failure to comply with discovery uh, motions very easily. I mean, that's, it's hard to get because um, it's um, usually it's not fair, it's, it's overhanded, it's heavy-handed, it, if, uh, it might, and the, the books say that it may very well violate due process unless you've got a lot of facts to support your case. And so, uh, the, uh, and for example, suppose you have a trade secret. And the other side wants to give up the trade secret. And you say, no, I'm not going to do it, but I'd rather take the sanctions. Well, you know, the court can do things to you, but giving a default judgment against you might very well violate due process. So you should have pointed out that the court gave a default judgment for failure to comply with the discovery sanction, the discovery order, and that might violate due process because that's the ultimate sanction and is not used easily. Continuing, uh, line 25, Paul filed a complaint against Dahl in the United States District Court for $23,000 personal injury. Now, once again, you see the issue that Paul has already sued once, but in the first lawsuit, 
Paul sued for personal property right here. He sued for personal property for $700. And if uh, the state follows the federal rules of civil procedure with regard to res judicata, the fact that Paul has sued for anything arising out of this transaction or occurrence, the entire transaction or occurrence is res judicata. It's over. But if you're in a primary right state, he's only used up this primary right, and he can now sue for the other three. And so in this second lawsuit, he is now suing for personal injury. He's suing here in the second lawsuit, personal injury for $23,000, personal injury. So he can do this in a primary right state only. is res judicata. Line 26. In his answer, Daw denied negligence. So Daw denied negligence. And we have a little problem because Daw, uh, if we go back over here, uh, in this first lawsuit, Paul sued Daw and Daw denied negligence and said that Paul was contributory negligent. Well, when Daw denied the negligence uh, and said, Paul, you were contributory negligent, a couple of things. Paul got his $700,000 judgment. Remember, Paul was only suing for $700 here. $700. He was suing for $700 and in this lawsuit and uh, Paul got everything he asked for. Paul asked for $700. Paul got $700. So Paul is going to say, look, Daw, since you claimed I was contributory negligent, uh, then the court must have decided that I was not contributory negligent because if I had been, then you wouldn't, I wouldn't have gotten everything I asked for. I would have got nothing or at least got it, you know, reduced. And so since since Paul got everything he asked for, Paul's going to say, that is proof that I was not contributory negligent. And he's going to try to hold that against Dahl, saying you can't claim I'm contributory negligent. So uh, uh, line 27, he, that is Dahl, also counterclaimed for damages for personal injury resulting from the accident. So Paul also counterclaimed for personal injury and again uh, for personal injury again this second lawsuit this $23,000 lawsuit over here and we're talking about this one is not going to happen at all if you were in the federal courts okay? because the entire transaction occurrence is over. If you're in state, a state court which follows the primary right, a minority, including California, in that case, this second lawsuit can happen. But when it does happen, uh, Paul over here is going to say, the court's already decided I was not contributory negligent. And that's not going to work because this was a default judgment. Nothing was litigated. And... Uh, and finally, Paul can sue for personal injury. Now, uh, the uh, uh, now moving to the cause of the question. Both Paul and Dahl moved for summary judgment based on res judicata and collateral estoppel. Line 33. By the way, tell the bar examiners what the rules are for summary judgment. That 
to prevail on summary judgment, the moving party must establish that that uh, there are no tribal issues of fact and that they're entitled to judgment as a matter of law, then go on to try to satisfy that. Let's look at these calls of the question now, because I think we've answered them all. Number one, was FedEx court correct in denying Paul Dahl's motion to quash? Where Dahl made a motion to quash saying you don't have personal jurisdiction, and we've done the analysis there. I don't think FedEx had personal jurisdiction. Item two, was the FedEx court correct in, defend, in granting a default judgment against Dahl? Well, they got the default judgment because Dahl wouldn't answer the interrogatory. Dahl should have appealed that, but he didn't appeal it. It became final, and therefore the court, uh, the, the court issued a sanction, the default judgment, uh, and uh, the default judgment stands but they're asking you, should the court have done that? And the answer is probably yes. And the reason, uh, well, yes or no. See, the, the information, the information, let's go back over here. The information that was being sought was privileged. And when Paul tried to get this privileged information, the court should not have given the order to disclose it. And, uh, but once the court gave the order to disclose it, Daw should have appealed. He shouldn't just ignore the court order. He should have appealed it. And he didn't appeal. So those are the things that went wrong there. So we ask you, should the court have granted the default judgment? Well, um, when they shouldn't have required Daw to disclose the information. But Daw should have appealed. When Daw didn't appeal, the court has other sanctions it should have used. And uh, should it have issued a whole default judgment on that? Probably not. This brings us to uh, the third item. How should the United States District Court rule on A? Now watch it. There's several things here. Paul's motion for a summary judgment on his complaint. There's two things here. And Daw's counterclaim. So let's take Paul's motion for summary judgment on his complaint. Well, Paul, right over here, Paul wants summary, wants a summary judgment on his complaint for personal injury. And the answer is no one has even proven that, uh, no one has even proven that Dahl was at fault. This was a default session. So in most jurisdictions, uh, uh, Paul cannot even use collateral estoppel because it was a default judgment. And therefore, Paul's motion for summary judgment should be denied. And secondly, Paul's motion for summary judgment on Dahl's counterclaim. Well, Dahl's counterclaim is right here. He wants $700 against Paul. And the 700 he wants, pardon me, Dahl wants personal injury. He didn't say how much against Paul. And should this be dismissed? Well, no. The only reason for dismissing this is Paul will say, the court has already decided I wasn't negligent, so how can you sue me for negligence? And that decision that he wasn't negligent was not entitled to collateral estoppel effect because uh, it really, uh, nothing was litigated. It was a default judgment. And uh, next, uh, B, Dawes, motion for summary judgment on Paul's complaint. So Dahl wants to wipe out his Paul's new complaint, $23,000. And Dahl wants to just wipe out the whole complaint. And the answer is, yeah. If the original state was a same transaction or current state, then this entire second lawsuit should not be taking place at all as a res judicata. And that's the answer to this question. Um, and that is the end of this lecture.